Okay, episode nine of Playing with Research in Health and Physical Education. Uh, today, uh, very excited to have Dylan Landy on. Uh, he studied at the University of Auckland, and where I first met him was at Teachers College at Columbia University. And he does a great job breaking down uh, a very heavy theoretical article in about 20 minutes. Um, so as a supplement, we pulled him and he ended up doing a supplemental podcast on new materials theory. So if you're interested more in that and the background of the theory that he uses to analyze his research, that's going to be uh, published at the same time as this podcast. So you can find it in Theory Breakdown. Uh, again, super excited to have a, uh, a good friend and a great young scholar in our field on the podcast. Here we go. All right, so we're here with Dylan Landy from Towson University, and we're going to be discussing his 2018 article titled Queer Men, Affect, and Physical Education. It was published in 2018 in Qualitative Research in Sport, Exercise, and Health. So welcome back to the podcast. Uh, this time you get to answer the questions instead of asking them. Thanks for the welcome, Risto. I'm really looking forward to answering some questions. So can you give us a bit of a background on where the field of physical education is with LGBTQ research as opposed to other fields? And also, am I using the right terminology, LGBTQ, queer, or should I be using other terms when I discuss this? Yeah, so um, both terms are fine. But if you're talking to a person, you should probably ask them how they identify and not just assume that they're gay, straight, lesbian, etc. Um, I use the term queer as a statement because it really means difference. Um, and I argue that all sexualities, including heterosexualities, are different, right? Um, the way you're heterosexual is not the same as your partner is. So um, LGBTQ, on the other hand, refers to specific identity terms, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or questioning, intersex and asexual. So um, it depends on what the uh, context is. Uh, as for queer research in PE, um, it's negligible compared to education, sociology, and psychology more broadly. Uh, actually, from we just did a, a an analysis, Sarah Flory, Carrie Saffron, and, uh, uh, and Risto Martin, and that's you, <laughs> and I, uh, where we looked at sort of uh, from 1982 to 2017, so 35 years, how many research articles were published and only 33 in 35 years addressed LGBTQ issues in PE. So um, it it's definitely has not been studied enough. Yeah, and I guess to put that into perspective, the research review that we're uh, working on right now of teaching in physical education over the last 20 years we had 1,023 articles, so clearly a small blip on the radar in, in terms of what, what we're looking at in, uh, in that research. So what do we know about research on queer men in physical education so far? So um, this is a really difficult question because we, we know very little. So just queer research period, the early stuff focused on lesbian teachers. And this is probably because, you know, that's all we had access to. Um, we knew that they got fired from their positions. If people found out they were verbally harassed, they were assaulted, damaged to their property. I mean, just horrendous. Um, so uh, that was the early stuff. The second wave of research explored how these lesbian teachers constructed their identities within PE. Um, and this was led by Heather Sykes. So, you know, how did they hide their identities? In what ways did the school affect their own identities? Um, then in the late 2000s, Gil, uh, Diane Gill of uh, UNC Greensboro, she 
led a project that uh, kind of looked at, you know, homophobic beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors, uh, and found that PE just wasn't a welcoming place for LGBT persons, period. But the real sort of um, research that we had was Heather Sykes' book, Queer Bodies, uh, in 2011. And this asked adults to reflect back on their experiences in PE and found out that most kids didn't care for it because of the harassment they received and the lack of um, uh, caring that teachers gave. Um, more recent, scholars like Haylin Glashen, Katie Fitzpatrick, Harkin Lawson, uh, Mikhail Kennerstedt uh, have examined actual teaching in PE, and they've claimed that the content is, sh the way that it's structured just assumes that everybody's straight. Um, Fitzpatrick and McGlashan called this a straight pedagogy. I built on this concept calling it straight Ning pedagogy because uh, it, it's not enough to call something what it is. You have to know what it does. But the important part about this is that all of this research assumed that LGBTQ or queer people sat outside the borders of PE or that they were abject. I, I critically called this into question in this paper, and I argued that actually, no, queer people and queer bodies are within the field of PE and were affecting it every single day. Okay, so... I mean, we, we do get into this new materialist theory in the supplemental podcast that we're releasing at the same time um, as this podcast. But so for those who haven't listened to it yet, can you I'm going to ask you a very tough question? Can you summarize this in a main point in about a minute? Yeah, so I'm not going to summarize all of it. I'm just going to give you kind of a brief overview of like why it was important to me. So if you listen to Kevin Richards' podcast on occupational socialization theory, which was fabulous, by the way, if you haven't uh, listened to it, go and check it out. It's on this series. He talked about how settings are socially constructed. So in research or philosophy in different areas, um, a binary or dualism has been sort of proffered about the nature of the world. Some people believe that it's socially constructed. Humans construct their social environments based on interactions and meaning making. And others, uh, essentialist, they believe that things are naturally developing and therefore undergirded by biological material processes. So in queer studies, this has taken the form of the quote unquote nature or nurture debate. Are you born this way or do we become gay? So new materialism, and for the rest of the time, I'll call it materialism, um, it offers a different view of this. And it says that our world is both materially and socially produced because our interactions occur at biological and social levels. So for this paper, I really wanted to examine how both cultural, so the social side of things, and material, how that is in relation to our physical bodies and selves, um, how these affect LGBTQ or queer identities, and more pointed, the uh, sexual desire in PE. Yeah, so what's what's interesting here on a personal level is that I sometimes want to hit the pause button on you and rewind, and now I can finally do that with this podcast. I can go back and really rewind that last minute because there's so much information in there, and I think it's really valuable to understand that. So I think the the supplemental podcast for those who are more interested in in the theory piece is going to be a great addition. So you, going into your method section, um, you state in the paper that it's not a traditional method section, and you do say that. So, uh, And you quote uh, Giardina in 2017 in saying uh, that you intended to, quote, return towards thinking of ourselves as philosophers of inquiry rather than researchers who use methods to gather data, end quote. And so can you explain that? Yeah, so traditional notions of research methods is I have a question, and what are the best ways to answer that question using which particular methods, right? Um, so instead of just assuming that methods themselves are quote-unquote neutral tools, that help us answer questions, I theorize the methods using materialist concepts developed by Deleuze and Guattari um, and Nick Fox and Pam Aldred. So instead of just accepting these methods, I ask, well, what do these methods do? Um, how does the setting affect the study? Are interviews really just getting information or does the time of day influence the interview? Does the topic influence the interview? How am I as the researcher in influencing the interview? So all of these things 
and I use this term assemble, they assemble together to produce particular results that then get reassembled or represented in a manuscript format. Great. Uh, so we know that you use new materialism here and we talk about you're going to use the word materialism going forward, but you also use critical ethnography. Can you explain that to the listeners? Yes, yeah, so critical ethnography is a way to understand the lived experiences of particular cultures. So instead of just interviewing people or filling out surveys, the undergirding belief of a critical ethnography is that if you want to know what's going on, you have to live it. So I inserted myself into the life of queer youth for about five months, walked in their shoes, tried to understand their problems, their struggles, and their strengths. I went to their schools, their jobs, their homes. I went to support meetings. And in a technical sense, yeah, I observed, uh, I interviewed, I collected artifacts. But more importantly, I built relationships with these resilient, like amazing youth. And because of that, it gave me a window into their world. And the critical side of it then looks at, okay, what are the things that are affecting these people um, to either make them uh, stronger or better, or what are the things that's diminishing their potential? So who were these youth that you followed for, for this five months, and where was the research done? Yeah, so the overall research project was um, uh, 60 uh, LGBTQ youth um, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, and it, while it was based in Auckland, it actually went all around the North Island. But for this paper, I, I drew on data specifically from 11 queer men uh, between the ages of 15 and 25. Um, most of them were between 15 and 17. Uh, seven were New Zealand Europeans. Um, one was born in the U.S., but was raised in New Zealand. Um, another of uh, the participants was a New Zealand Indian. Um, one of the participants was Tongan, and another was uh, New Zealand Asian. So a lot of different perspectives uh, throughout this study. So from a variety of data sources that you've, you've interviewed and followed these students and spent considerable time in and among them in their lives. So you come up with a results section that you categorize into the main themes into three sections. So one is assembling sexy bodies, two is assembling queer desire, and then the third one is queer desire as productive. Can you kind of uh, break, us, break us through that? Yeah, so what, when I say the term assemble, I mean the ways in which systems arrange things. So for example, how a classroom, how chairs, desks, students, content knowledge, posters are arranged in that space. Um, and all these arrangements are the results of multiple things that come together and interact with each other. And these things can be physical things like the chair or the person pushing it. They could be cultural things like the norms of the school or abstract things like the curriculum itself. Um, and, you know, they could also be identities, you know, the queer kids that sit next to each other or the jocks that want to sit next to each other. So all these things get arranged in certain ways that represent a, a classroom in this case. And what I looked for is how queer identities, queer desire, and queer bodies were being arranged or assembled in PE. And it first of all, it was according to biomedical content knowledge. Um, it was according to sports skills, and it was uh, according to what the culture assumed or considered was an attractive body. So in other words, the students felt like they were constantly being told what a healthy body was, and it was athletic, and it was sexy. The problem is that the biomedical knowledge in this was not value free. You know, the students were keen to sort of point out that they were gendered. You know, girls were expected to have big breasts and tiny waists, racialized. You know, um, if it was a particular sport, they were expected to be white or Caucasian or uh, Maori, brown bodies in another sense. And because biomedical knowledge underpinned this, the notion of reproduction is the point of sex. So everybody was assumed to be heterosexual. So in a way, PE was trying to assemble sexy and athletic bodies. But what was sort of interesting was that this had an effect on what queer students became attracted to. So because the athletic and sexy body was assembled in PE, queer students started to be attracted to the uh, athletic and sexy body. One student, Suva, was actually being physically assaulted and harassed in class, but because the student who was assaulting him had this athletic and sexy body, 
he ended up having a crush on the kid, which then further um, exacerbated the harassment, you know, because you're attracted to somebody that is assaulting you. So not only are queer bodies being assembled in PE, but their desire, their sexual desire was as well. Um, another example was the student actually desired the athletic men in changing rooms, and this caused physiological reactions in his body, um, an erection. But he then had to hide this because he knew that if others saw it, he would be assaulted and harassed for it. So while it, the PE space produced homoerotic desire, it also produced it in a restricted way to where he had to hide it because everybody was assumed to be heterosexual. So you know, the important part about this, though, is that desire is not just a simple thing that we're attracted to, but rather it has the potential to disrupt things, places, and produce new ways of thinking. So I call it productive. So think about your first kiss, you know, the incredible feeling that it produced in your body. So when queer desire is produced in PE, it's an incredible force or power, and it can affect other things. So when these students were allowed to express themselves openly, they actually challenged gendered stereotypes of PE by wearing makeup, or one student was being bumped into and was um, accused of being gay because of that. So he pushed back and he said, yeah, maybe I am gay. And it, it gave him the ability to shift the thinking of that area. Oh, wow, not only uh, women wear makeup, but men do. Oh, wow. Um, gay men are not this effeminate, passive subject, but rather they, they can be masculine and they can push back on these things. And I think in your paper, you actually have these specific quotes in there that kind of do a little bit more justice to the individual voice of these students rather than trying to explain it in a few minutes. So for those of you that are that are listening that want to read more into it, the paper actually has a lot more detail in that results section. But when you go into your discussion, you say that you resonate with a call by other researchers to see physical education as a queer space, despite its disconnect from queer topics. So what do you mean by that? So we started off this podcast by saying, hey, there's only been 33 research papers in 35 years. Um, but what we know is that there are a lot of queer people in PE. You know, uh, from 1982, um, we were seeing uh, lesbian pioneers in the field of sport and physical education. Um, so even though it's not something that is studied often, there are many queer people in PE spaces, and if we allow them to express themselves openly, um, it, it can actually shift the field. So we, we we can't continue to pretend that you know our our content knowledge, which tends to be like uh, uh, justified through biomedical knowledge, uh, that that's going to work. Because what happens is we erase the lived experiences of queer people. We need to take a more balanced approach. We need to talk about social issues in relation to skill development and cognitive knowledge. It can't just be one end of the spectrum. It needs to be a balance. Now, you talk about one of your insights from the paper is about breaking down the false binaries that have plagued the plagued our field in, in physical education. Can you speak more to that? And what do you mean by false binaries? Yeah, so binary means two that sit on the opposite side of things, a dichotomy or a dualism. When, when we started this podcast, we said there's a belief that queer people are either born this way or they're socially constructed through society. But in this paper, I argue that, you know, it's a little bit of both. Queer students came to PE realizing they were sexually attracted to the same sex, but PE shaped their sexual desire by assembling it towards sexy and athletic bodies. So this has huge impacts because identities or subjectivities are not just influenced by biology or uh, the culture, but rather it's the way that our body, our material body comes in relation to culture that tells us what sexuality, what identities, what subjectivities matter over time. And, and at the end of your paper, you cite uh, Heather Sykes who calls for a radical change in the field. Um, what do you what do you personally think that the field should be focusing on? Yeah, so th this is a little disconnected from the paper, but um, 
I think we need to focus on the affective domain in PE. Uh, we need to, you, you know, when I read, uh, for example, uh, some guidelines, um, the Shape America guidelines uh, more specifically, you have pages upon pages of psychomotor skills and cognitive skills, and you have maybe one page you could fit all of the affective goals or the domain in that area. So we need to expand PE into seeing um, the affective domain as central. Uh, and Kirk makes this argument more recently. And if we're going to do that, that means that PE is connected to the community. Um, it teaches social issues around health and physical activity. Um, skill development and public health in initiatives, uh, like increasing physical activity, you know, we're never going to make a large enough impact if we just stick to that. Rather, we have to teach students to think critically about their local policies, their local practices, their communities, and ask critical questions about how we can move beyond thinking of the individual as this bounded subject. You are in charge of your own health. Well, actually, no. There are way more factors that go into it, and we need to think about those factors and how can we uh, make or ameliorate, make better uh, our communities so that more people can value and uh, participate in physical activity. And it's a it's a very complicated, complex process. And I and I do think that, you know, focusing on the affective domain is something that we can do really well in physical education. Any other uh, comments that you have? No, just thank you so much for having me. And um, if anybody uh, wants to read the paper, it's on qualitative research and sport, uh, exercise and health. Um, a plug in for that journal. The reviewers were fabulous. So thank you to them and thank you to the editors. Um, thank you to David Kirk for his critical feedback. And of course, always thank you to my um, supervisors for my PhD. Uh, they've been awesome throughout this, uh, Katie Fitzpatrick and Richard Pringle. And thank you, Risto. Thanks, Dylan. Um, I mean, I really learned a ton from this. And again, for those listeners who want to read the full paper, uh, like Dylan said, you can find it on Qualitative Research in Sport, Exercise, and Health. Um, thanks for listening. Really appreciate it. Bye.